One of the more unusual devils of the Nine Hells are the Arrhenius, also known as the Eumenides or the Furies. They have always maintained a lot of independence from the strict hierarchy of the Hells because they are the spirits that are sent to the Prime Material Plane to collect those who have condemned themselves to an eternity of punishment, primarily by making false oaths. Swearing an oath is a kind of magic in Dungeons and Dragons. It holds real power. So when someone talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk, there are infernal consequences. Thanks to the great pact between celestial and infernal forces, that only those who broke their promises to the gods would be consigned to the Nine Hells. When you break such an oath, and it involves any kind of battle situation particularly, the Arrhenius, the Furies of Hell, the infernal opposite of an Angascardian Valkyrie, will arrive to swiftly collect your damned soul. Furies do not bargain, they don't play silly games with mortals, and they are brutal, efficient, and extremely well experienced as infernal beings. As long as they are not destroyed in battle in the Nine Hells, they can usually return to active duty after some recovery time, variable depending on the exact nature of their defeat outside of the Nine Hells. Devils reform eventually and usually have recovery boosts in place or can get themselves mired down in obligations if they are forced to beg or bargain for those boosts to restore them to their former power. And Renews who get stuck in the Nine Hells have plenty to keep them occupied for centuries, if need be. If you think each of the Nine Hells as a different hostile environment for training purposes, there is that the Arrhenius also engage in contests of strategy with ice devils, jungle warfare with monstrous plants and animals attacking them constantly. They also lead excavation and capture teams deep into the mysterious ice fields of Cania, and many of the isolated citadels there are owned by the Arrhenius, stocked with their own private army of specialists and laboratories, forges, and stockpiles of powerful arms and armor. There is a good reason for this isolation and fortification, and here we need to go into the history of the Arrhenius and the Brachinas. The origin of the first devils is shrouded in confusion. It makes good tactical sense in a multiverse where time travel is possible through magic. You don't want your infernal enemies in the blood war getting accurate coordinates to important formative events in your history. We know that at some point, the forces of law that were fighting against the forces of chaos became corrupted and became native to the lower planes, we call it fall. Not the celestial ones, there were a particular breed of celestials who became the first Arrhenius, and from the ranks of those, successive generations of new Arrhenius have been born, and also the deliberately altered Brachinas are elevated from the population of Arrhenius and possibly other things. Pit fiends and archdevils use the extremely seductive and attractive Brachinas as playthings, discarding them as quickly as they select them. Thus, these seducers are quick to take any assignment they can to avoid the brutal attentions of their masters, and remain in the prime material plane until they've attained whatever number of souls they are after. Brachinas can be male or female. They have amber hair and violet eyes. They're extremely sexy and known as pleasure devils, for a very good reason. They specialize in corrupting the servants of the gods, the virtuous and the self-righteous but weak-willed. They delight in orchestrating their doom. Unlike the Arrhenius who just think all mortals are weak-willed beings easily driven to evil with a simple promise of physical gratification, but the Arrhenius are not seducers, they are assassins, and it's easy to see how this can be confusing. So let's take a look at their origin in Greek mythology. They're quite different to how they are presented in Dungeons and Dragons games. That whole thing where the elves believe their spirits were spawned from the spilled blood of their god Corallon, that is actually from the mythology of the Furies. The Arrhenius were sister goddess figures similar in some ways to the cursed Gorgon sisters. Ironically, the Gorgons, including Medusa, were supposed to have wings, while the Arrhenius did not. Well, the reverse is true in Dungeons and Dragons, along with some important behavior and appearance aspects, which makes the original Furies more like harpies than fallen angels. So D&D Furies are very sexy, original recipe Furies are hideous hell hags, who scream horribly as they rip you open with brass claws. So let's just ignore real world history, it's not really applicable. A few important defining aspects of the Arrhenius is that they are the most similar to mortals in the Nine Hells. They can be 
any particular gender they wish, but unlike other devils who can only sire children, the Inrenyes can also carry and birth them as a mother. They seclude away their offspring and oversee their development closely, not allowing any outside interference so their culture remains strong. Irinyes are not succubi, you can tell them apart instantly by their wings. The Irinyes have dark feathers, the succubi have the classic fiendish bat-like skin membrane wings. There are far fewer Irinyes and Brachinas than there are succubi, but they outrank them in the infernal ranks of the Hells and their commands carry the authority of Asmodeus, thanks to his ascension to even greater levels of power. Unlike most other devils, the Furies can enter the mortal worlds whenever they choose. However, they can't take anyone else with them, so they are used to operating alone. They'll use magic to disguise their celestial wings and locate some goons they can easily control. Not always through magic. Gems and coins also work just fine. So does their reputation for being master martial artists. They get quite a lethal cadre of followers just by teaching them a few of the combat techniques that they know. Oh, I should say, Enrinis can't transport people out of hell, nor can they take inorganic material back and forth, but they can take one being with them back to the Nine Hells, a victim they are dragging back for eternal damnation. I'll quote directly from the Forgotten Realms wiki article, more or less, on them in regards to their society within the Hells, as it's quite complex. Favoured by a despater for their beauty, skills and unshakable allegiance, Arrhenius were common within Dis. Sigia also possessed a large population of Arrhenius, with a whole regiment being responsible for protecting Levistus's frozen tomb from aerial intrusion. They can be found in greater numbers within the political labyrinth of Melodomini and within Genopoli specifically. They acted as patrollers to dispel or counter offensive magic and all the other attempts at violence. Along with Pelerians, they are seductive Arrhenius enjoy a noble position and noticeable favoritism within Glazia's court which often provided them targets. Hunters were known to stalk the skies of Melbolg for intruders without safe letters of safe passage, often capturing charismatic enemies for Glazia to torture or seduce at her leisure. Even Arrhenes, who do not work under archdevils, often directly report to the Dark Eight, instead of having an intermediary master. While some served as servants or were simply concubines, others had vastly superior tasks, such as spying on enemies and allies. Many Arrhenes were responsible for bringing justice to hell, although the method by which they did so varied greatly. Donning horned helms and stylized armor, Arrhenes warriors brought death to those who defied their infernal masters or the orders of Asmodeus himself. As arbiters of justice, they acted on behalf of hell and were responsible for tracking down those who broke infernal contracts. Others acted on the side of the law, helping to free mortal souls by acting as legal counsel for those who did not receive what they were promised or were forced into making their own deals. The role that earned Arrhenius the most respect, though, among the devilish peers, however, was that of the temptress. The succubi rank below the Arrhenius, and the Brachiners are on a whole other level beyond either of the others. The archdevil Mephistopheles employs Galugon Ice Devils and Arrhenius operatives to patrol Cania in search of spies from the Iron City of Dis, along with escaped prisoners, slaves, experiments, and all of the above. The Galugons and Pit Fiends who command squads of Cornugons, the Horned Devils, greater devils who can get in a variety of other devils, from a small mob of Lemures, a group of Barbazus, or Bearded Devils, the elite frontline skirmishers of the Nine Hells, or a gang of Abishai, scaly devils, the draconic devils who are kind of the gutter scum of Hell's armies, and of course, the horned devil can also summon a few other horned devils. So it's rare that the ice devils or pit fiends have to leave and lift a finger in their own defense. The horned devils are loyal and highly capable bodyguards for the elite Bartizu devils. So why is Cania so interesting, aside from being a frozen layer of the Nine Hells and home to the archdevil Mephistopheles? Well, it's what's frozen inside all that ice. That is the reason all the excavation and experimentation is going on. To understand what is going on with that is to understand why the Arrhenius are so involved with Cania. There are hints in the various editions of the Manual of the Plains, Plains of Law, Guide to Hell, and Morden Canaan's Tome of Foes. These sources tell us the environment of Cania is brutally cold. 
devils other than the Galligons don't enjoy going there. A gust of wind in Kenya is around minus 60 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 51 degrees Celsius, which will kill unprotected creatures quite quickly. Storms in Kenya are a great blend of freezing blizzards plus unstable ground and hidden crevasses. The very frequent avalanches are also deadly, and it wouldn't be the Nine Hells without packs of snarling lemures and mute bloated nubaribos and worse, tucked into every crack and shelter that provides even a little protection from the freezing cold. The entire plain seems to consist of huge mountains with highly mobile glaciers and ice sheets that travel at a brisk walking pace across the plain constantly. There are currents and flows that can be mapped unless you are anywhere near the home of Mephistopheles, named the Citadel of Mephistar, as he has control over the great glacier Nargis and his great base rests within and can travel around the plain, disrupting other ice flows in catastrophic and spectacular tumbles and explosions of ice, creating a highly chaotic and deadly landscape under his control. There are countless preserved corpses within the ice, but Entire alien cities, such as the one called Kintyre, have also been discovered. Regions where huge creatures can be seen deep in the ice, or great armies of archons or divas fighting desperately against some spined creatures nobody can identify are also present. Ah, fallen archons and divans. Divas, you say? The deep ice of Kania tells tales of pasts that no longer exist as the multiverse has twisted and transformed over and over again in the ancient wars for controls of reality itself. My theory is that these armies and creatures date back to a time when there were far fewer different zones of existence. Creatures such as the Draden, living demiplanes that were still able to move around in the most disrupted and chaotic areas. However, it's a task even imagining a reality in which a Draden would feel right at home. I don't even want to think about it. The Inrenes know a lot more about these ancient artifacts, creatures, celestial corpses, and alien cities than anyone else suspects. They occupy thousands of secret laboratory and library citadels all across Kenya, in the deeper steps of the frozen wastes, and the deep chasms cut deep into the heart of massive mountains, resonating with the dull grind of ice over stone. The warehouses and prisons and armories of the secret agents of Kenya are loaded with potent weapons of personal and mass destruction. Nightmare creatures that have a habit of disrupting reality and causing madness in creatures that get too close to them. Alien technologies that can twist matter into fractal shapes, drain or transfer life force. Celestial warheads, interdimensional parasites, phase crystals and potent engines that can create inverted freezing plasma beams. It's important to remind ourselves that the Ice Devils, the strange insectoid-looking Galugons, are notoriously cold-hearted and brutal taskmasters. They can't tolerate any weakness and will simply execute weaker fiends around them when they have served their purpose or just want to vent their anger. They are big, standing 12 feet tall, their hands, feet and their long tail are covered in spikes. They are very skilled at using powerful infernal arms and armour. They deal with the Arrhenes all the time. So there is a harsh relationship between them where the Galigons will randomly scheme and pitch some brilliant and nasty sneak attack on Irini's citadels just to keep the Furies on their toes. Neither Galigons or the Furies devote much of their time and attention to collecting, trading or making use of souls as they have much more interesting things to mess with they are constantly digging out of the ice. Now, there are other fiends that dwell in Kenya, there are, which are part of the strange independent sub-hell going on. While in the second of the Nine Hells you'll find the Chain Devils, known as the Chitons, in Kania there are the Excruciarch Devils, who are great beefy brutal butchers clad in thick leather aprons, mask cruel tools of torture and great cleavers for hacking apart meat and enemies. Excruciarch fiends are also known as Pain Devils and they sell their services as torturers. Under their creepy leather attire they have pale skin and red eyes, no hair, and they're about six feet tall, but they just seem very broad and seem taller thanks to boots, spiked shoulder plates, and usually some large intimidating hat. These devils love to torture helpless victims and are known to lure victims by appearing much weaker and helpless than they really are, overpowering a defeated foe and destroying any sense of hope. Standing near a pain devil will cause small cuts to appear all over your body, and any touch from a weapon they carry delivers unimaginable pain of a magical nature. 
They typically operate in pairs and use large scourges in battle. Where there are pain devils, you will also find the horrific Cochrachins. Insectoid, but more like bizarre beetles, whereas ice devils look more like some lizard mantis. The Cochrachins are five foot tall, dark purple blue bugs with wings that emerge from flaps in the exoskeleton. Six thin long limbs, two legs and four arms end with pincer claws. Aside from using instruments of torture, these weak but sadistic bugs can inject a disease-loaded goo into victims that will slowly kill them over weeks. They can also heal victims the same way, tormenting them constantly. Strikes from Cochrachins are particularly debilitating because the creatures spend all their time taking victims apart and sometimes putting them back together again, whether they like it or not. Because the Cochrachins are so resistant to cold, they tend to find a home in Kenya and are common enough in many of the citadels of the Arrhenius that they often kick them out of the way or basically treat them as no better than furniture or unwanted pests. Arrhenius most often use the bugs for their excellent ability to get information. It's what they do, after all, torture victims and extract secrets from them. Oh, fun fact, the devils who become the Cochrachins do so very deliberately by enrolling in the School of Pain, located underneath the Knoll of Blades in the Layer of Dis, a school founded by the pit fiend named Pierza, a member of the dreaded Dark Eight. So while lesser devils, the Cochrachins do have a bit of reputation for being very nasty, and their slow torture being particularly good for breaking a victim's mind. Seeing an Arrhenius in, com- in combat is like watching some evil counter-universe version of Wonder Woman, armed with an enchantment rope of entanglement, epic s- magic sword and bow, clad in custom armor that doesn't sacrifice style for practicality, her weapon strikes are coated in caustic venom, and she coordinates very quickly with her allies while laying down spells and weapon attacks from a distance, only closing into melee range when it's time to finish the fight. Arinyes earn promotion through reputation for being extremely cunning and creative, because to rank up from their positions means significant escalation in their command of the armies of the Nine Hells. It's even possible for an Arinyes to go directly up the rank to pit fiend though of course they have to endure the same 1001 days spent in the pit of flame that the galeugons do in order to qualify for the position so let's take a look at their stats basic stats in fifth edition DD. they're a challenge rating 12 threat armor class 18 153 hit points all attributes well above humans of course all the physical combat side of them is fine plus eight to hit with a long sword coated in poison plus seven to hit with a longbow and poisoned arrow. Nothing special about that poison at all. It says they have magical resistance, but I don't see one mention of their ability to charm or enthrall anyone, nor cast any spells, nor gate in other devils, and minor oversight. While the Rinyes do have telepathy, they never use it to seduce their victims. Okay, so clearly they have all the seductive powers of the succubus automatically, and give them a spell less similar to a bard with some dis- decent illusion and mind control magic. Plus, they have very capable of using teleportation magic, as it's often part of their operational duties, and a natural choice for the devil that has the power to just move freely between the infernal and mortal realms. Plus, every single one of their weapons and their armor, plus a bunch of assorted wondrous devices, should all be magical as hell. And that's about all I have to say for the moment about the Arrhenius, but... I probably will be back to Cania later as it's the last stop before reaching Nisus and the home of Asmodeus after all. In the meantime, my name is AJ Pickett as always. Thanks for listening, liking and subscribing and I'll be back with more for you very soon.